Susie. Huh. What happened to the future? Aren't we supposed to have like hoverboards and flying cars and stuff? Yeah, and jets and houses. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like we kind of went to the moon and we sort of dropped the ball after that. Yeah, like we broke our arms patting ourselves on the back after that one. Well, especially because there were a lot of really worthwhile projects that just kind of fell to the wayside, like the atomic aircraft. And the atomic aircraft was created in the 1950s, and the federal government decided that they wanted to try and build an airplane that could fly for months on end. And they wanted to make sure that this could happen in the middle of the Cold War. And so instead of discovering how to perfect in-flight refueling, which is what we currently use, the innovation of the Radiant Era decided that it would actually be easier to put a nuclear reactor inside of an airplane and then make that fly. And the crazy thing is, they actually got it to work. And the aircraft reactor experiment ran for 10,000 hours without any hiccups whatsoever. And two weeks before it was supposed to take off and actually fly for use in the military, the program got canceled. And this isn't exactly uncommon either with these programs. What ended up happening is that in Oak Ridge National Lab, a lot of the innovation done by H.G. McPherson and Alvin Weinberg was always under the scrutiny of the government. And they kept hitting political barriers after economic barriers and everything else. Every few years, they were always in danger of having the program canceled. So what ended up happening is they realized that their entire life's work was at risk. They documented everything meticulously, 47,000 pages of documentation. Back in 1972, the federal government finally decided that this would be the end of it. We need nuclear warheads for the Cold War. We don't need energy. We need to keep going with uranium, and that was, since that was what was being used in the nuclear navy. Consequently, all of these documents were pushed aside. They were put inside of a closet in Oak Ridge National Lab and effectively forgotten for decades. In the early 2000s, they were finally declassified and they were released to the public and there was a very small group of people and they saw these documents and they saw the same vision for the future that the original researchers did and they ran with it. So how do these nuclear reactors work? Well, to kind of go, we have to go back to the beginning to be able to fully understand this. And when I talk about the beginning, I'm talking about, well, the beginning. Um, a couple minutes after the Big Bang occurred, the first protons started to form. And these protons amassed themselves into the universe's first stars. These stars were the easy-bake ovens of the elements. Hydrogen fuses into helium, helium fuses into lithium, lithium into beryllium, all the way up into iron. But wait, there's, there's got to be more elements than iron. You know, helium through iron, they're heavier than that, right? Yes, but stars actually can't produce anything heavier than iron. So that's where the mighty neutron comes in. The neutron comes, and if you throw a bunch of neutrons at atoms, you can make them larger, and you can turn them into different atoms, making everything heavier than iron. So what happens when these atoms get too large? Well, they kind of get unstable. They really don't like to hold themselves together, and they'll break apart, releasing heat and energy. Uh, and this is, this is how nuclear reactions can work. Uh, in the case of a uranium-fueled reactor, uh, we can control the reaction rates by controlling the amount of neutrons that happen, because these neutrons can actually cause the uranium atoms inside of a reactor to spontaneously disintegrate and generate a lot of heat. When we're working on our reactor, and we're going back to the liquid fluoride thorium reactors that were originally developed back with the aircraft reactor experiment, we actually have a design of a, a sort of flow chart of what this reaction will look like. You can see in the reactor core, that is where there will be uranium. Outside of that, there will be a fertile thorium blanket. Neutrons will be given off out of the core, they will be received in the blanket, and from that, the thorium will then transmute into uranium. It will go into fuel processing, which will separate the fissile uranium, which will go back into the core, from the fertile thorium, which will go back into the blanket. Since the reactor core is what's generating heat, that is what goes through the primary heat exchanger. From there, it will go to a secondary salt and the secondary heat exchanger, and that's how we're able to generate electricity. That's how we're able to turn this into a power-generating nuclear reactor. And actually, what we brought with us today, you can see behind us, is our prototype for our fuel cask. So this was a prototype um, from conception to machining to assembly. Took about two weeks to do. We decided we wanted to have something really cool other than CAD drawings. Um, so we threw this together. And what it does is it's a prototype fuel cask um, for our demonstration reactor that we're trying to build. And it holds about 32 people's lives worth of thorium. Imagine 32 people in this room taking up about as much energy space as this. The energy density of nuclear power is absolutely astounding. Um, each of you, if you were filled by thorium power, would use about a ping pong ball size chunk of it in your entire lifetime. And there's not just the power applications for this. 
One of the things that we're really pushing for this reactor design isn't necessarily to replace commercial coal plants on a one-off basis. There are plenty of companies that are working on that, and we don't necessarily feel that that is the best place for us to be working on this, especially in these early stages. So with the other applications that we have for these designs, it's primarily going to be used in disaster relief and can also be used in military applications. So if anyone remembers what happened with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, there were a lot of deaths that were actually attributed, not to anything regarding uh, drowning or any of those sorts of deaths, but they were actually because they didn't have access to electricity and they didn't have access to clean water. In some instances, that can account for up to as many as 50% of the deaths out of uh, a hurricane fatalities. And one of the benefits out of these reactors is that they're quite small. They're scalable. We can make this as big or as small as we need it to be. We can airlift it into any location that it's needed, and from there we can actually generate electricity and use it for a microgrid. In the, in the diagram that we had showed earlier, when it shows the electricity production, it's actually going to be using a turbine that uses a gas as opposed to using water. Um, it's going to use a noble gas, and using that, we're actually going to be able to create enough excess heat that we can purify the water as well. So we can have clean electricity, we can have clean water, and we can bring these in on a moment's notice to set up disaster responses. In addition to that, we also have the capabilities of using this for military uses. And in those instances, a very significant portion of attacks on military personnel happen in logistic routes. They're bringing in petroleum, they're bringing in water, and they're bringing in resources for the troops to use. And it's been a long-standing technique of war that people will attack those routes. They will attack the logistics operations to then hurt the rest of the infantry units. So we're proposing a design that can actually be used in all of these ways. In addition to that, with the thorium fuel cycle, we're able to generate additional isotopes. These are isotopes that are used in medicine. So these are used in everything from radiation treatment to medical imaging. Currently, all of the isotopes that are being used in the US are produced in other countries, primarily in Canada and South Africa. And as far as being able to actually have a steady stream of this, it would be very beneficial for us to be creating these domestically. So what's the catch? Well, with nuclear reactions, just like chemical reactions, there are byproducts. Uh, when you burn gasoline, you get water and carbon dioxide. Uh, with nuclear reactors, it's kind of different. Instead of, instead of getting these different chemicals out, you get different elements out. It's, it's kind of strange in that fashion. Um, with traditional uranium reactors, you have waste that has a half-life of about a million years. Um, and you can only use something to the order of like only 1% or less than 1% of uranium fuel before it has to be thrown out. Um, with thorium reactors, we can actually burn up this, this uranium waste. And yes, there's still waste produced from thorium reactors, but it has a half-life of, say, 60 years. So we can throw it you know, in, a, uh, in a shielding pool or some other cask uh, and put it inside of a mountain for a century or so. And we can use that, and then once that's done, we can throw that into a landfill, and it's uh, essentially back as radioactive as the dirt is today. So what are the risks? Well. <laughs> Whenever you have 33 people's lifetimes uh, worth of energy in a space that small, um, the first thing on most people's minds, if they're nefarious, uh, is to weaponize it. I mean, how can we release all this energy at once? And that's what we did when we made the bombs. Um, but thorium is inherently, with this fuel cycle, um, it's inherently difficult to make weapons. However, if you try hard enough, it is certainly possible. But we believe that this is a risk we have to accept. Um, as a general populace, we've been using motor vehicles. And those motor vehicles, they have a mortality rate. But we kind of accept this as a day-to-day -day basis. You don't rarely hear on the news report about car crashes. Um, but we, we still accept them because we use them to make our lives easier. We've, we've harnessed the power of the electron shell to, to power our daily lives. If we were still using horses and carriages, we wouldn't be able to travel nearly as far as we have at this current era. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.